Hey everyone, this is Ross, and in today's video, I thought it'd be very helpful to talk about rootstocks and you know what a rootstock is, and you know also how this how a rootstock really relates to growing fruit, and what are some of the benefits of using a rootstock, and then also my thoughts on where I stand in terms of using rootstocks and grafting uh, in terms of figs specifically. Um, because certainly for more fruits, um, certain fruits than others, uh, it's a widely used practice is using rootstock. For other fruits, the research isn't there, the experimentation isn't there, the dedication, the passion isn't there. Um, certainly for you know things like stone fruits, um, pears, heavily in terms of apples, there has been a lot of research and a lot of time spent um, developing rootstocks and propagating rootstocks and you know um, also you know really um, putting into practice and science the differences and the benefits of each rootstock um, you know in terms of other fruits like figs as an example there isn't really a whole lot of information out there on using figs as rootstock and um, really it's kind of like shooting a dart in the dark you're never really going to know what you get unless you really spend five ten years with these rootstocks to properly evaluate them um, so i often get the question well what's the best rootstock for figs and the truth of the matter is no one really knows um, so i i do want to thank the person who prompted this video uh, someone commented on one of our videos a couple days ago so shout out to that person and they pretty much asked me for this video, you know, where are my thoughts on rootstocks and figs and um, so if you want to see a video uh, that you think I haven't already done, you know, just post the, uh, post the question down in the comments on any of my videos and I may just make a video on that topic. Um, so yeah, definitely encourage that. Um, so I guess the first thing we could start off with is what is a rootstock? Well, a rootstock, uh, as most fruit trees are, are, are grafted. So there's usually a scion, which is what's on top, and then you have what's on bottom, uh, which is the rootstock. And that's really the root system of the tree. And they kind of separate them. A lot of experienced and expert growers, they will separate the scion the scion will have a bunch of characteristics and the rootstock will have a certain set of characteristics based off of their genetics and their, um, you know, how much time they've adapted in certain locations and certain climates. So they're quite different, the two of them. And rather than having, you know, every single tree um, be very different because we're not always growing the same variety of fruit, right? We have many varieties as most of you guys probably have. So each variety just has different genetics, not just in the fruit themselves, but how the tree grows and how the tree behaves, or even if it's a bush, um, you know, how it just performs in general overall. Um, so I think it's a great idea to really um, make things more streamlined, more easier, um, really eliminate a lot of guesswork that a lot of us have, unfortunately when it comes to all these different varieties of figs or different varieties of fruits. Um, they're also very different. So if we had them all in the same rootstock, we can really eliminate a lot of, you know, things that we would think are as differences when we could pretty much have them all in the same root system, graph them all in the same root system, and they would all behave a similarly way um, in terms of their rootstock and how that then would affect uh, the top of the tree, which is the different variety that we're evaluating. So it really, um, it may be difficult. I think it's quite difficult for certain people to grasp that are a bit newer at this. Um, but it really does make a whole lot of sense in the long run um, to be grafting just about every variety you have. And, you know, maybe it's not all on the same variety, but certainly you have maybe a, a selection of different rootstocks that you like to use and then that's sort of suited towards your needs and they're sort of achieving a similar purpose and some of these purposes that you know you can kind of get out of this um, you know and this is a great website by the way guys I'll try to put this in the 
in the description, but this is a great write up by Cornell talking about propagating and, you know, um, you know, different, different forms of, uh, of rootstocks. And then also things like the, the history of rootstocks. I could get into this and we could talk forever about it, but it's not something that really interests me right now. Um, and you can, I want to talk about right now though, the benefits. So some of the benefits of rootstocks are mostly size control. I mean, that was really the big one. Um, and that's in my mind, sort of the big one when I think about grafting figs is that I want a similar vigor amongst all my trees. I want to be able to apply a similar growing practices, similar growing techniques to all of my trees rather than say, all right, well, this tree is just really finicky. It doesn't really grow all that well. I have to do something special to it to get it to the same level as all these other fig trees are at. You know what I mean? It's kind of the same thing. Um, going back to my my earlier point and that we all should just have them and more streamlined that way but there's other things that rootstocks can do for us and some of them are not really that clear as i mentioned like the science isn't necessarily there for every single rootstock and every single tree and every single species of tree um, but you get a lot of resistances to maybe let's say pests um, it can definitely help with resistances to even some cold um, increase that hardiness a little bit. You may even get some like differences in the chill hours that are needed. Um, you'll get some differences in disease resistance. Um, you know, all kinds of soil adaptations. You know, in terms of um, you know where this tree should be grown. If it can deal with heavier soils, uh, more sandier soils, areas with lots of uh, lots of water and, and standing water, um, even pH as they're mentioning here. I mean, this is really a great breakdown of some of the 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 good benefits of of using a rootstock. So, for me, in terms of um, you know suckering, I guess that's a good one, and so is burr knots specifically for for apples. Um, and other stone fruits you and you know things like pears and you you could get a lot of suckering that way um, if let's say you had it on a different rootstock or if even you didn't even have it on a rootstock you definitely could get a lot of suckering and um, that's just a lot of work a lot of hassle that doesn't really need to be there um, in terms of figs I find that there is still some suckering regardless of the rootstock you use, but there is a lot of apical dominance that figs show. So you, you really won't have a whole lot of suckering that goes on, especially if you're very careful with the rootstock and you don't sort of encourage it to put out more suckers. That actually is a process and a thing that can happen. If you have a sucker that comes up from the base um, and you don't really pull out that whole stem that whole thing there and you leave a piece in there it's just gonna keep suckering um, year after year and it's kind of annoying it's really um, some of these trees can get really out of control with that so definitely um, I'm not entirely sold on the fact that maybe a fig tree could benefit from a variety that just doesn't sucker as much um, but I'm sure there is some sort of variety out there. The biggest thing that comes to my mind, the biggest benefit of using a rootstock with figs that has mostly been proven now, um, LSU had put out a, a document in the past, and this was kind of along the lines of when they were using their, uh, their figs and they were breeding figs. They put out a document stating that LSU purple is root knot nematode resistant. So... In my mind, a lot of the palmata, um, ficus palmatas, are also root knot nematode resistant. Um, they're also supposed to be resistant to fig mosaic virus, so there could be some um, help and aid with some certain viruses that you guys may have and may struggle with. I mean, we all have fig mosaic virus. That necessarily hasn't really been proven just yet. But certainly the, the root knot nematodes, guys, that if you are grafting and just planting LSU purple um, in a sandier root knot nematode soil, you're going to have a lot more success grafting them onto LSU purple or even just growing LSU purple. My grandparents have an LSU purple tree down in 
uh, the Boca Raton area of Florida. They're literally in sand. Um, they're right off the intercoastal. I mean, they live on an island for for goodness sake. Um, they've struggled with figs in the past, growing in the same location that they're growing an LSU purple tree in, and the LSU purple is just doing incredible. Um, so big recommendation there. Um, in, ter in terms of disease resistance, right, we're still not entirely sure, but there's not really a whole lot of disease that really affects figs anyway. Also in terms of pests, there's not really a whole host of pests that affect figs. And it would be very difficult for me to say that a certain rootstock is actually aiding with SWD um, or maybe even, I guess, a better one would be the spotter and lanternfly because uh, I'm sure at some point I'm going to have to deal with that. Um, but mostly it's really to streamline. And this is really my, the point I want to drive home about this is that, yeah, we want to have, we want to have all these different varieties. We want to be able to compare them and compare them accurately and be able to say that one potentially is better than the other because of X reason. And if we don't have them on the same rootstock, that's giving us, let's say, even just something like consistent fruit size, consistent vigor, which then the vigor leads to then a better productivity, right? Because the figs form on the, the new wood. So if we have weak growth in the spring, we're going to have low production in the fall. So, you know, it really does uh, make a huge difference, I think, in terms of size control, or at least in terms of vigor, um, than most other fruits um you know what other fruit trees are going to fruit for you that year um on that new growth and there are some of course that do that but it's not always on that new growth regardless of what was left over you know because uh, a fig can still fruit for you even if you cut the tree back all the way down to to nothing um so i think it really does um just for that reason alone make a whole lot of sense and i i regret to inform a lot of you guys that i don't really have all the answers myself um in terms of all right well thinking about what rootstock would work the best um i don't really have that answer in fact no one has that answer and i don't think there's been any scientific real studies on actually there has there has been one but that was mainly about root knot nematodes um but i would imagine and this is sort of where i think we're going to succeed if someone really wanted to try and do this for all of their trees i recommend it for potted trees for in-ground trees you name it for figs this the issue though is that you need to have that rootstock survive and you need to have the top survive so this is not really something i can really experiment with in the ground here you know, if you guys live in a zone eight or higher, you can do this. But for people in zone seven or below, you're not going to be able to just do any grafting on trees that are in the ground unless you wrap them and you can ensure that they live every year. But it's just one of those things, guys, that um, we don't really know. People have not experimented enough. You know, I can maybe come up with a pretty good explanation and a good um set of information for you guys based off of my own opinions and then also other people's opinions and their experiences you know that's kind of what we did with our recent video in terms of like the the figs that i recommend for california or hot or dry climates you know that's largely based off of other people's experiences and then also some of the fruits that i i've grown or i've uh, i've tasted myself you know, this is an area where it's literally, I don't really know many people at all that are doing any grafting whatsoever. Um, and they haven't been able to come to any sort of, if they have, you know, if they are grafting, they haven't been able to come to any sort of conclusion whatsoever that's worth anything. Um, you know, myself, I've been sort of just grafting on every which rootstock I had available. I wasn't setting out and saying, all right, well, you know, I'm going to use only this and only that and we'll see how this works. I, I was just grafting onto everything. And I think there's some benefit to that because while it's not really clear 
it is sort of clear in other areas because you could definitely tell that certain rootstocks are doing slightly better than others. And what I can tell you is this, is that the, the healthier the tree was to begin with, the better the rootstock. So we've talked a lot about rejuvenation pruning and that's really just cutting out all that sort of dead wood or damaged wood on your tree, encouraging the tree to put out really new and healthy growth it's a thing that Pons has talked about in his book. Um, it's a really highly recommended technique that I, I'm going to be using here in the spring and pretty much forever, I think, with all of my young trees is getting them off on the right foot is by chopping them down to the base. We then encourage new shoots to come up from very healthy stock and they almost are virus free. They're very vigorous and that really puts out a nice base for the tree in future years to work from. Um, it's not going to get damaged. It is really has the right node spacing. It's got everything that you would want, the right nutrient flow because it's so healthy um, for the future. So that's, I think, a big recommendation. And it's not just in terms of the trees that are, are on their own roots, but also the rootstock. I think this is something I totally neglected and hadn't even realized that this is something I should have considered. But I've had plenty of rootstock and trees that I just didn't like. There's been plenty of trees where I said, you know what, I really am going to get rid of this tree because it's not productive or I don't like the the consistency. It seems a bit finicky. It has to seem like it has an issue with this little thing, this little thing. I mean, for whatever reason. And I'm sitting here thinking now, knowing what I know about rejuvenation pruning and getting these trees off to a really healthy start. I'm now saying to myself, well, I probably should have at the beginning chopped them all back. And even though I wanted to use them as rootstock and I got a lot of grafts out of these, especially if they had multiple limbs and they turned into Franken figs, as an example, where you graft multiple varieties on the same tree, my trees really were never sort of healthy to begin with, some of these trees. And as a result, I was probably misled in some of my findings with some of these varieties. I have a feeling that, yeah, it probably wasn't as exaggerated, or maybe my thoughts were more exaggerated than I had originally thought because my tree had some sort of issue preventing some nutrient flow. You know, that's kind of how I look at it uh, now, you know, knowing what I know now. It's kind of like a bit upsetting to me a little bit, but. You know, that's sort of what I'm getting at here is that we need to not only do this for the trees that are on their own roots, but also for our rootstock. If you really wanted to do this professionally and the right way, grow your rootstock out for a year. The second year, we cut them back to the base or a lower point on the tree, leave a couple nodes. You know, I'm not saying cut the tree back to nothing. But leave a couple nodes and you're going to get one new shoot that comes up from the base that's extremely healthy and also very vigorous. And that is the shoot that we then graft to and our tree is then formed on. Um, so, yeah, it took me a while to get to that point. But um, I think you guys got it, right? Is that rejuvenation pruning is super important. This is really going to help not only just make the results and the findings of your varieties more clear, but it's going to make everything much more streamlined. And, you know, it kind of makes you second guess yourself, unfortunately, is that really it's like, wow, I didn't know this really important fact. And I think the majority of the people in the fig community don't know this important fact and they're not taking advantage of it. And we're all sort of just succumbing to the same thing. Um, there are some people who are just because of their pruning habits are doing this um, without even realize they're doing it is that they're just having very heavy pruning every year. And as a result, they have some pretty damn good results. Um, so I think that's what I'm um, getting at there in terms of the health of the tree that should be considered first. Um, I guess to rewind a little bit before I get into that, I think we were talking about um, the vigor of these trees. So we really need to consider not just the health of the rootstock itself, 
Um, but also the um, the vigor of the rootstock. And this is really something that I was sort of conflicted on years ago. And I've certainly learned my lesson on this. Dealing with the just the large mass of different rootstock genetics that I've been dealing with here is that the more vigorous the rootstock, the better off, I think, as a general rule of thumb, we're going to be. Um, so things like brown turkey and things like uh, Izmir and raspberry latte and some of the LSU figs are very, very vigorous. Um, like LSU tiger is super vigorous. I think LSU purple is very vigorous, but also root knot nematode resistance. Um, a lot of seedling trees are very healthy as well. They don't necessarily get that fig mosaic virus right off the bat and they tend to just like to grow. I don't think that's necessarily a great idea. Um, I think we should try to tend to go towards a rootstock that's healthy, vigorous, that's also well adapted to a particular climate, a particular just scenario that you're looking for. Um, whatever that is, you know, I think that's pretty general, but, uh, I think that's a great idea. Um, so yeah, I think vigor should be the main concern here and you could pretty much take what I just said, that little formula and apply it to any variety. I'm not going to just name off every single variety of rootstock I think would be recommended, but, um, you know, just take what I just said and apply that to the variety you're thinking about and, make a little checkbox, you know, does this match the vigor level that I'm looking for? Is this rootstock adapted to the climate that I, I'm going to be growing in? Um, you know, is it healthy in terms of virus free? Did I get it off to a great start? Does it have good node spacing? How's the root system looking like, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think we should definitely be bare rooting and evaluating the the roots of our trees a lot more than we do as well. I've really learned a lot looking at some of the roots, the root structures in some of my trees um, this fall when I bare rooted about 30-ish trees that I sent to a lot of you guys. So yeah, this is a pretty broad topic and maybe it didn't really offer as much help as you guys were hoping for, but that's sort of the, the formula and the general information that's out there, you know. Um, Rootstocks, to summarize, can offer just a lot of benefits, um, namely the, the benefits here that they're talking about on this website that I'll, I'll put in the description. Um, you know, we're also, um, you know, there's a lot of benefits. There's also uh, a lot of things to consider, like the size of the tree, the disease resistance, the pest resistance, the... Um, type of soil that you're going to be growing in. I think that's one a lot of people forget. Um, then in terms of figs, the information is not really clear. There's not a lot of people doing this. My recommendation is to graft every single variety that you have onto a rootstock that you think is quite vigorous, healthy, and um, you know is adapted to the soil that you're growing in and the climate that you're growing in. Um, all in an effort to streamline this whole process of evaluating different varieties and eliminating a lot of potential issues that you may think are because of the scion um, and instead could be very easily corrected by putting it onto the right rootstock. I really do find that, uh, especially comparing my two Hate of the Argentile trees this year, I was able to evaluate a tree that wasn't very healthy, I'll give you that, on its own roots. So a hate of the Argentile that needed some rejuvenation pruning, um, you know, was in my care for three years. I fed it well. I watered it well. It had a nice root system at this point. Um, but then I had also a tree on a nice rootstock that I had grafted, and it's only two years old, so a year younger. And the difference was very clear to me. It was very obvious, you know, and especially certain varieties as we've sort of mentioned in the we have mentioned this in a couple other videos i think in one of our fruit talk episodes at our end of the year summary that we did for 2019 we talked about some figs with like special requirements and special characteristics this category right here 
I found that just some of these are very difficult to establish. And you can maybe take Cole the Dama off this list, uh, but certainly Black Madeira, UC Davis, and Ashia Black, UC Davis, they're they're just very um, you know prone to that FMV, and they have it more heavy than other varieties. It seems like um, Pastelier, if it's the more um, shortened and dwarf variety of it. Um, but Grease de Saint Jean, at least the Grease de Saint Jean, yeah, definitely Grease de Saint Jean and Hate of the Argentile. These are two varieties that I very specifically have noticed that they have very weak root systems. And because they're so weak and they're just difficult to establish, just off that point alone, you should think about all right, well, it should be grafted, right? Because if it's more difficult to establish, and just about everybody agrees, um, you know, unless you're feeding your trees just like an incredible amount of fertilizer, um, you know, I have seen a number of experts, people who have been growing these varieties a lot longer than I have, all say the same thing about those two. And you know what? Um, why go through that? You know, why put yourself through that and instead just streamline these these differences, these these growing practices that you're going to be using. So you can recognize the differences more accurately. Um, you know, just to go over really quickly a couple differences here. You know, in terms of the consistent fruit size between the two hate of the Argentile trees, that was a big one. Um, not only was it the consistent fruit size, we had some dropping on the tree on its own roots. Um, uh, let's see, what else? The... Um, the, the overall appearance of the fig in the exterior seemed to be a lot more representative and a lot more um, mature. Um, it seemed to be have like a higher quality to it. Um, yeah, I mean, just kind of everything about it in terms of the production as well and the vigor as well. Um, I wouldn't say there was a huge production difference in production. Um, but you know what? There, there's one year on the other tree versus one year on the other one. So the difference, even though it was quite similar, it, it's kind of quite different. You know, um, certainly in terms of the time it took for it to ripen as well, uh, they didn't ripen at the same time. And I think if I go down here to my hate of the Argentile, we can see the date. Yeah, so this one ripened almost a whole week uh, later in the season. Um, also there was less fruits, as I mentioned, um, and it just seemed like it was just a whole lot more problems with the tree. Um, you could tell it was kind of struggling along to get its act together really the whole year. Um, and it's been like that for three years with it. So yeah, that kind of just sums up my video here, guys, on rootstocks and I really do think that you guys got something out of this and maybe, uh, you know, I can't definitively say that I'm 100% correct and I don't think anyone really can in terms of figs, but um, yeah, I think it's it's really well worth trying and I do see a huge potential and, and for me, if I was going to do this commercially and when I do it, I should say, in the future and I have all these trees in a greenhouse scenario. Um, kind of like you know a tree that I can protect I don't have to wrap it every year and I can afford to graft it I'll be grafting it and every tree also in from this point forward for the most part even in pots I'm going to eventually transition over into the perfect rootstock I think that would be used for pots and the one that you use for the in-ground tree versus the one for pots is pretty much the same um, I just think maybe you want a little bit less vigor, just a tad lower, you know, maybe not the most vigorous variety that you would have in the ground, but maybe something slightly uh, less vigorous that would maybe help with um, not having to root prune it as often. And that's really the only concern I have with that. Otherwise, you still want that vigor. Um, so yeah, I think uh, this was a, yeah, again, a very helpful video. If you guys enjoyed it, let me know if you have any other questions regarding the topic, let me know. Um, check us out on FigBid. We still have a lot of cuttings for sale that we're trying to get rid of by mid-January. I'm offering you guys a 30% off discount. Just message me on FigBid, the promo code ROSS. I'll deduct 30% off of your order. I'll adjust the invoice. This is before you guys pay. 
Um, so you can purchase everything in your cart or put everything in your cart. It'll create an invoice. Don't pay the invoice until I, um, I adjust it for the discount. So, all right, guys, we'll talk to you soon. Uh, thanks for watching this one. Take care, guys.